Welcome to Open Minds Radio with Alejandro Rojas. Open Minds Radio is your UFO news authority, presenting evidence and the latest news regarding the UFO phenomenon. Here's your host, Alejandro Rojas. Hello, and thank you, Mr. Roberto Dean, for introducing me. That's always so nice, and I know people, we got some comments. Some guys like, that's so sweet that Robert Dean is your intro. That is, thank you very much. We have a lot going on. I know you guys missed the hell out of us. We missed you, too. People were freaking out, but it's okay now because we're back and we're better than ever. One of the questions that I have been getting quite a bit before I talk about who our guest is, it's about Frank Kimbler. And I keep talking about him every week because people people keep asking, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? And some of you may have seen online that, yes, indeed, one of the samples uh, that he sent, the first sample, he sent it to a lab to have it analyzed. But according to the lab technician, when the package got there, it was not there. He told us on the air that he was going to walk those samples personally to see them get analyzed and I know it sounds like maybe to some of you out there who are you know kind of like me a little bit you know you would think that's just kind of ridiculous that you would have to do that you can mail a sample how could it get lost what's the big deal people mail stuff all the time um actually I get stuff lost in the mail all the time but anyway it wasn't it she opened the package and it wasn't there so very strange of course conspiracy minds are flying how did the sample not get from point A to point B. Some people are thinking, well, maybe Frank forgot to put it in there. That's what the lab tech thought, actually. But as we know, we've had him on the show. He's a very rigorous person. He uh, takes every step uh, of the process very seriously because he teaches science, and this is what he teaches his students to do. So he's very careful. So there is absolutely no doubt that he put the sample in the package, at least in my mind or his mind. Uh, But somehow, between point A and B, point B being a very trusted source, so this lab uh, that it went to was someone that was, uh, a friend had referred someone who could be very trusted. Uh, The person who opened the package is someone that this person knew. So all all along this chain of, of those we know involved seem to be very reputable people. So it is very strange, of course, that this sample is gone. Luckily, as Frank says, it's no big deal because he has many more samples. Uh, He's got something like 14 in total. So not a problem. He is going to keep on trucking along and uh, get those analyzed. And uh, we'll see where it goes from there. But I did want to update people because people did put that on the web. And uh, I wanted to confirm that I've been in contact with Frank, and that is indeed what has happened. Some people have accused Frank of doing it himself, sending an empty package so that he could say, oh, man, I had this ET proof, but it was stolen by the government, and now it's gone. That's kind of ridiculous because, just like he said, he's got other samples. I mean, if that was the only sample, maybe I could see that people thinking that you know i've met him i know he's not a goofy guy like that um he is a very serious person so uh but he's got more samples so that kind of blows that kind of out of the water that frank is trying to pull any kind of silliness and if you yourself are a scientist or you have a lab and you would like to get involved with helping frank in this process you know please contact us uh, we have had actually a couple of people contact us who we've referred over to Frank and Frank has talked to. And uh, in fact, when we posted our story, there were some people asking, well, what about the square root of 64 on page 39 of the analysis? And, you know, way over my head. So I forwarded them to Frank and they were able to talk about uh, their observations about the analysis. So that's th- my voice for a very smart guy, like mathematician. Well, what about the hypotenuse of the, you know, something like that. But, uh, as opposed to, you know, the common kind of guy. Hey, what's going on? What the hell's a hypotenuse? You know, that's that's the other voice you guys have heard me do. So that's what's going on with Kimbler. I wanted to update everybody so they know because we've gotten so many questions. Also, in Open Minds News, very exciting. I'm very excited. 
I got to meet and talk with Dan Aykroyd. And uh, he was, we partied, uh, you know, and uh, got loaded. And the next day, you know, he let me do a little interview with him. And we were just so hungover. Actually, if you know me, I, I don't drink so very much. I have about a glass of wine or equivalent once a month, like literally. I've got a 12-pack of beer that I got nearly a year ago, and I've still got six of them left because I can't even finish a whole one. I'll open one and have maybe a quarter of it. Just not my thing. But anyway, anymore. Lord knows I used to drink a lot. But anyway, uh, I did get to meet Dan Aykroyd. The only truth to that story I just told you was that actually I did get to meet him on Sunday morning. He was doing a signing of his Crystal Head Vodka. I go there and I get in line. The line is, I got there 15 minutes early. The line is down the street. So I get in line thinking, wow, this is going to be a couple hours. And then our super cool video director guy, Tom Ruffin, who you guys have seen his work because he puts together a lot of these videos. He calls my phone and says, no, come up front, come up front. And he got us in, and we were able to uh, ask if we could do an interview. And Aykroyd was super cool. He was really excited about it. He looks kind of tired in the interview, so you can't tell. You kind of at first think, is he annoyed by, you know, Alejandro bugging him like this? But actually, he's really cool. He's like, no, come around, you know, get this guy a chair, you know, let's talk. And so he was really cool. I got to ask him a few questions. It was extremely busy. So we were in and out of there as quick as we can because these people that I was getting in the way of their getting their stuff signed had been there for hours waiting in line. And here's some chump talking and taking up all of Aykroyd's time while they're trying to get their Ghostbusters stuff signed and everything. But we did talk to him about UFOs, a subject that he loves. It's near and dear to his heart. And we have a story up today at openminds.tv where you can see that video, which, of course, is on our YouTube as well. And then... uh, on the Open Minds TV story, you can read actually an article that was just in our Hollywood issue of the Open Minds magazine, which outlines Aykroyd's background in UFOs, the different how he got involved with UFOs and the paranormal, and all of that sort of thing. So it was very cool. Aykroyd is a super, super cool guy. I mean, this guy is so cool. He's cool with everybody. You can see in the video where he's messing around with people and having fun. He's just a really cool guy. And then uh, someday maybe I'll try the vodka, but I don't want to open up my signed bottles. But you can even see my signed bottle on the website there. So that was a lot of fun. I wanted to let you guys know about that. But I also want to let you know about our guest today. His name is Jason McClellan. And he just wrote in the latest issue of Open Minds a story about Billy Meyer. And he was able to do, I mean, he really went in depth. He which is tough. We sat down and we're like, you know what? Someone's got it. We've been talking about this for months. Someone's got to write the story of Billy Meyer. Antonio and I, of course, have have a little more background in it, but we're a little more biased too. Although I've typically been on the fence on this one. And uh, so, but we didn't want to do it because we knew it'd be a lot of work. And we volunteered Jason before he got to the meeting. But uh, he came and he said, yeah, I'll take it on. And he did. And he was very thorough, read a lot of information, did a lot of in-depth research. And so we decided, I decided to bring him because it was a great story to the show. Um, He had a long way to go to fly out here, actually to drive down the street or stay here a little later. Actually, he flew in from San Diego for the show. But... um, so we could talk about his research, and so uh, people on the show can hear, okay, here uh, is an unbiased opinion of someone who just, you know, tackled the issue to see what he could discover, and he discovered some things I didn't know about and that I think are very interesting, and I, I won't uh, give it away because I'll make you guys have to wait, but it actually, uh, you know, just the information he provided uh, made me change my mind about uh, Billy Meyer. You don't know which way I'm going to go, though. So you're going to have to wait for that uh, for a little later when we get into the interview. So this is the Billy Meyer Show. I know some of you are waiting, and there's people that are so emotional on either side here. There's the pro-Billy Meyer camp, and there's the anti-Billy Meyer camp. Very little in between. 
mostly people are very uh, much on one side or the other. But, you know, we um, want to stick with the truth and we're risking pissing off one of you groups of people by going over. And I'm sure some of you are waiting. Is he going to make me mad? There's no way. He's got to believe what we believe. So we'll see what happens. But before we do that, let's bring on this other guy, our news correspondent. Uh, he's the guy that you can see in our ultra cool Simpsons cartoon done by Dale. And uh, he's the guy with the mohawk there. Uh, he's a character in real life as well. And that is Jason McClellan, our news correspondent. Jason, why don't you tell us about some of the UFO news of the week? I will, and I'll do it very quickly because your guest sounds extremely exciting today. Take your time. Oh, all right, I will. <laughs> but first, I want to point out that, as promised, mm. I am drinking from my Dale Hendricks. And our YouTube watchers, or if they're watching right now on uh, Yes, Open if you're Mind watching TV. right now on the video, you can see the coffee cup I promised that has the illustration done by our friend Dale from The Simpsons. We're and just so happy about this. There we are. You, Maureen, and I are there. Your hands are flailing in the air. Yep, just like that. One of the coolest cups I've seen in my life. Yep, and now you have to get one, and Maureen yep. has to get one, and, and we'll so all have our coffee world. cups for the show. Yeah, very sweet. All right, let's do some news. This is your Open Minds UFO News Brief for Monday, September 12th, 2011. Approximately 20 UFOs were seen in the sky above Moravia, Costa Rica on Saturday, August 27th. The mysterious lights were witnessed by physicians, agents of Costa Rica's version of the FBI, and Alejandro, I'll say this just because I know that you want to practice saying this because this is important because you're a, you're a Spanish speaker. It's actually called the Organismo de Investigación Judicial. That's their FBI or equivalent of the FBI. So they were physicians, these doctors, and their FBI equivalent agents and other professionals at a party. And the witnesses initially thought that the lights were from helicopters, but no na aircraft was ruled out by the nearby airport control tower. Witnesses claimed the UFOs were visible for five to 10 minutes, moving from east to west through the sky. One of the witnesses recorded the lights on video, which was later broadcast on Telenoticias, a local news station. And according to InsideCostaRica.com, the video was being subjected to analysis and field research to determine what the lights were. But following the incident, a family revealed to investigators that they were responsible for the lights in the sky. According to Telenoticias in a follow-up uh, follow report, the family said they launched 27 Chinese lanterns on August 27th as part of a 50th wedding, a wedding anniversary celebration. And similar lights were seen in the sky um, in the Caribbean, but the same family claims responsibility for those lights as well. They claim that they sold Chinese lanterns to a relative who happens to live in the Car Caribbean. So that's kind of strange and convenient. But those who witnessed the 20-plus lights above Moravia on August 27th have a hard time believing that the lights were simply Chinese lanterns because their, their description of these lights, and again, these are the doctors and the government agents, describe the lights as having an intelligent movement about them. Mm-hmm. So we've seen Chinese lanterns, and they're, I won't say obvious, but you can pretty much tell what a Chinese lantern is in the sky. And these people saw these lights and thought it was a helicopter and saw them moving through the sky intelligently, as they mm -hmm. say. Then comes this family saying, oh, yeah, that was us. And then they said, well, what about these other lights? We also, they were also seen in the Caribbean. Oh, yeah, that's us, too. <laughs> yeah, and the Caribbean. Yeah. That's kind of wild. I mean, yeah, I could see them launching some some Chinese lanterns. But then to say, that's what throws some doubt in here is to say that these Caribbean ones were also them and they knew about them. That's that's kind of interesting. It is kind of interesting. I mean, we hear this a lot. Mm -hmm. We have witnesses who capture these lights on video and then we hear stories of people coming forward saying, oh, those are from our party. Why are you people yeah. freaking out? And it's certainly plausible. You know, yeah. it's a plausible explanation. It does happen. I mean... We know that your neighbors probably freaked out when we launched them at <laughs> yeah. your house. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting that this one family claims responsibility for all these lights that we're seeing. Yeah, and I mean, the flares, you know, at the military base, those uh, have freaked out people like where I live. And I videotaped them, and they look strange. So it can be hard to tell. Even with the Chinese lanterns, I can see how they would be hard to tell uh, unless you watch them for a period of time. 
I mean, they may appear to go over the horizon when they're really falling. The ones we saw, they dropped pretty quick. Yeah. So, and these witnesses said the, the lights they saw were five to ten minutes. So that's about the time of a, yeah. a long Chinese lantern. But Yeah, so that's possible. Yeah, the thing that throws doubts is the credibility of the witnesses and that these people are saying, oh, yeah, those were, those were ours. And also those these government sets. agents, you know, these agents who supposedly or yeah. their job is investigating things. They probably investigated strange lights in the sky before. Who knows? But they are trained observers. So the fact that they were kind of freaked out by these lights is interesting too. Yeah. Well, in February 2011, and I will say this, this is a, uh, a slightly dated story, but I wanted to mention it because we had talked about it a lot on the show um, back in February, and I hadn't delivered a follow-up to this story. So I'll do that now. Uh, Lucy Hawking, writer in residence for Arizona State University's Origin Project, launched a writing contest called Dear Aliens, which asked students to answer the following questions. What would you say to extraterrestrials if Earthlings are contacted from outer space? If you had to speak for humanity, what would you say? According to the Arizona Republic, nearly 1,000 messages were submitted to the contest. Benjamin Lee, a seventh grade student from Mesa, Arizona, won the contest. And at a ceremony in early April 2011, Stephen Hawking, Lucy's father, presented, uh, well, he was the present at the festivities they had. They had a multi-day sort of fest for their origins project, and Stephen Hawking was there, and he read Lee's message, which stated, Dear aliens, please help save our world. Not from you, from ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are destroying our planet and need help from more technologically advanced beings. Our planet is polluted. Many nations are at war, there is civil unrest, and our economy is in turmoil. And despite Stephen Hawking's grim warning against attempting to contact aliens, Lee's message was beamed into space where it was bounced off the moon. Professor and theoretical physicist Paul Davies was also involved with the Dear Aliens contest. Davies is head of the SETI post-detection task group, which means that when contact is made with extraterrestrials, it is Davies' responsibility to determine what message is to be sent back to extraterrestrials. Yeah, you know, it makes me think, though, maybe that's not a bad idea. Maybe we better start sending out our SOSs right now at the rate we're going and how long it takes for the messages to get out. It's probably not a bad idea to start SOS, <laughs> SOS, as we're blowing up our planet. Who knows how many weird messages have already been sent, so yeah, they're going to respond to something. But it is know. funny, you're right. It's a funny point that, you know, um, Stephen Hawking is over here saying, you know, wherever we are to not do this, they're going to come eat they're us. They're going to come attack us and wipe us out and take our planet. And his and daughter's out there sending messages. Yep. Don't be silly, Dad. Yep. Hopefully he won't be able to say, I told you so. <laughs> no. It was interesting that he actually participated Yeah. yeah after being so public about warning against the contacting. And it's funny that this wasn't a bigger story for that reason, because uh, when he said it, you know, that, that that could happen, it was a big story. Mm -hmm. So I would think that this is, and it's a fun story. It's got the kids and everything. Um, and, you know, all these other stories lately about uh, aliens, green aliens, like they're talking about coming to help us with our, our or coming to destroy us because we're destroying the planet type yeah. of issues were big news. You'd think this would be bigger news. Well, I've got to hand it to Paul Davies. I, I think he, this was a brilliant thing for him to be involved in because it cuts his workload. He gets free submissions. So he uh, chooses the best one and goes, aha, there we go. I don't have to figure out yeah. what to say now. Well, and he is out of the SETI group. You know, I even saw him and Shostak debate this. He is more into the Medi side, which is messaging extraterrestrials, yep. uh, physically sending messages out because people need to remember SETI, they're listening. They're not sending messages. They're just listening. But uh, Paul Davies is more into the actual uh, idea of sending messages because he does believe that a, a more of technically evolved species is probably also more um, spiritually evolved or socially evolved where they will be nice to us. They'll Excellent. treat us like pets. I could be a pet. That's fine. Reminds me of the Porno for Pyro song. We'd make great pets. It it's allows you song. to be lazy, and people like to be lazy. So Yeah, and get fed. Make someone take care of everything for you. All you got to do is be cute and giggle when your alien tickles you. That's sort of what a lot of people are in uh, in corporate America. Of the <laughs> CEOs yeah. 
They're, they're basically pets. I mean, they, they can't take care of themselves. They've got 20 yeah. different secretaries and vice presidents and this and that. And they need our millions of. of dollars so oh, they yes. can have nice clean cages. Yep. And be taken care of where people clean up be after Driven them. around, flown around. People to make their schedule for them. Yeah. Do their laundry. Mm-hmm. Make their food. So that's I a good idea. A the aliens need to come yes. and take them. Yes. These corporate. They, they're, they're already trained for it. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Take well, them away. It wouldn't be a news report without talking about fireball. So I've got a fireball story. Right. We talked about this one two weeks ago. But a fireball UFO plunged to Earth on Thursday, August 25th in Cusco, Peru. And according to CBS News, the object was initially suspected to be a meteorite. But new information suggests the object could have been debris from a foreign country spacecraft. The Peruvian military has reportedly been actively searching for the object in the outskirts of Cusco for several days, complete with helicopters and commando units. According to news site TIWY.com, the Peruvian authorities have been warned by a certain friendly government that most likely the debris of the space truck Progress M-12M have dropped uh, in the territory of the country. Progress M-12M was an unmanned Russian spacecraft launched on August 24th on a resupply mission to the International Space Station. And shortly after the launch, uh, there was a malfunction that was detected and communication with the craft was lost. The Peruvian military hasn't found anything yet. So until they do, this strange object that burned through the sky uh, is still a mystery. But again, this story could have been updated, but I haven't seen any current information about it. But they were out in full force with their commando units looking for this thing. Well, I know the Russians said they finally figured out what went wrong with their rocket, but I don't remember seeing, and I don't know if I read that whole story, that they recovered the rocket right. because they couldn't find it for a period of time. Um, and there was also another lost rocket. There was the X, uh, what was it, the name of that? I forget what that group. one is, but their super fast plane. No, who was it? The Google guy? Oh, yeah, the Google guy. Who launched his uh, spaceship and then they lost it. And these two incidents are creating a lot of problems right now. Yeah. Two lost rockets. Yeah. That's kind of scary. And it's been big big problems for, for NASA because they rely oh, on yeah, these the rockets one. right now, these mm-hmm. Russian rockets that did launch this Progress M-12M. Right into space so they've kind of put everything on hold for now Mm -hmm. because clearly they can't rely on that until they figure out what the problem is yeah yeah it's kind of scary and i guess that could explain all these fireball ufos because everything being launched is getting lost and plummeting down now that you mention it does seem like a story that is kind of behind the scenes that isn't really getting pushed also which is that this russian rocket had problems so they had to suspend their uh launches back and forth to the space station and then there was news that nasa is thinking about and probably has started to fast track a couple of their projects so they can launch something up there even building a new shuttle so i think by the behind the scenes what we're not seeing is there are some people you know a little worried about this whole situation that maybe we cut too many programs and now we don't we can't you know shuttle our our astronauts back and forth but it was really weird to see that they're even taking parts from shuttles that they didn't build to build a new shuttle they're Mm -hmm. talking about right and this could be good for our local private space company spacex i know is is close to being ready with their rockets and they do have a contract with nasa so hopefully that's good news for them yeah get some good old us of a rockets Yep, need to get uh, get our guys home. Well, the movie Apollo 18 tells the story of what really happened to the 18th Apollo mission. And while the filmmakers are calling it a documentary to create the illusion of reality, NASA is worried that viewers might accept the movie as fact. Bert Ulrich, NASA's liaison for multimedia, film, and television collaborations, recently told the Los Angeles Times, the film is a work of fiction, and we always knew that. We were minimal, minimally involved with this picture. We never even saw a rough cut. The idea of portraying the Apollo 18 mission as authentic is simply a marketing ploy, perhaps a bit of a Blair Witch Project strategy to generate hype. It's strange that NASA feels the need to go on the defensive. Uh, NASA's response is clearly the result of the filmmakers' marketing efforts, which have included using UFO researcher Stan Friedman as a publicity figure for the film. 
Friedman has made a number of appearances to lend his opinion about whether or not the real Apollo 18 and Apollo 19 missions were truly scrapped, including uh, an August 15th appearance on MSNBC's Dylan Radigan show. Space.com reports that in press materials for the movie, Friedman is quoted as saying, people ask why there, why there was no Apollo 18 mission. I ask what happened to Apollo 18 and Apollo 19. They were both paid for and astronauts were trained. What happened to these missions? And while NASA is urging moviegoers to ignore the claims of reality by filmmakers, the Los Angeles Times points out, NASA realizes that keeping the public interested in the extraterrestrial is critical to its future. Ulrich explained, it's a wonderful way to reach the public through these huge media means like feature films and television shows, and it can inspire people in an interesting way, and it can also instruct people about what space, space exploration is all about. Yeah, I think typically they wouldn't mind except for, it's probably because of mostly um, a little bit from Blair Witch, but especially from uh, Fourth Kind. Couldn't think of the movie name. Because that caused a lot of controversy where they were claiming that, you know, these abductions really happened and people were really lost and that the uh, newspaper out there had written about it. In fact, the newspaper, I think, even sued the movie company because they were making all of these claims that weren't true. And it caused all of this problem. So while NASA likes people believing in extraterrestrials, they probably want to be careful that there are probably people and there might be some people listening to this show who are getting mad saying, what are you talking about? Fourth kind was all real. Sorry, people. It was not. None of that was real. Of course, as we all um, study the abduction phenomena, and it seems like, you know, there's something to this phenomena. There's something real going on. But fourth kind was not real. That found footage was not real. Those were all actors and actresses. Nothing from that movie was real at all. And you have a lot of people, even to this day, believing that there was something to that. And I'm sure there are people listening to this show who think I'm wrong, but trust me, I'm not. Um, watch look the into it. Yeah, just watch the credits. There, Those were all actors and actresses. Those weren't really university professors or, or uh, real people uh, who have had these experiences at all. Even though you have the actors and the actresses at the beginning and the end, acting so serious that this is real and blah, blah, blah. And I think that's what they're worried about, that people, unfortunately, will get fooled and start to believe that, oh, my gosh, look, there was an Apollo 18, and and we saw it on the movie, and blah, blah, blah. And they just want to be clear. It's cool to watch these movies and have fun and believe in ETs because we want you to pay us to go find ETs. But uh, don't think that this movie is real because it's not. Yeah. NASA's had some interesting marketing efforts lately you can't just you can't trust marketers anyway i trust marketers select marketers i trust myself i trust our our colleagues we have a wonderful marketer here who would like to bs you yeah if if they could You're so mean. Beware of marketers is all I'm saying because I've worked with marketing departments uh, my whole career. And, uh, yeah, they will often have you say things. They like to stretch the truth. It depends on who they are, what they're marketing, and what their ethics are like. Hello, it's it, marketing in America in 2012 is, a, is something that is not trustworthy. You're right. I will no longer trust Maureen. <laughs> Don't say it. I didn't say that. Yes, you did. did. It came straight out of your mouth. You're in trouble. We have this on video, and you can see it came out of your mouth. Your mouth, my friend. I was interpreting what you were saying. I tried to give you an out, and you didn't take the out. Okay. Do you have another piece of news? You'd like me to move on? Yeah. Let's do that. Well, former Army Intelligence Officer John Alexander was recently interviewed by George Knapp on 8 News Now in Las Vegas, Nevada. Alexander is vocal about his belief in UFOs. As he stated to Knapp, UFOs are real, and I'm talking about physical reality. There are craft that are seen, balls of light flitting around to craft, some of them a mile and a half across. They show up on radar and are really here. In his new book, UFOs, Myths, Conspiracies, and Realities, Alexander's skeptical nature is apparent. He doesn't believe the government has covered up knowledge about UFOs. 
a view that has garnered scorn from some UFO believers, Alexander told Knapp, the true believers are even more hostile than the skeptics. If you don't believe their particular brand, whatever that is, you become the enemy. You've got to buy every bit of it. Otherwise, you are part of the cover-up, and blah, blah, blah. Some of this hostility was displayed in February at the International UFO Congress, at which Alexander was a speaker. And we've got a video up on our YouTube channel that shows a little bit of kind of attacking Mr. Alexander. I think that he likes to play the martyr, though, but he's not as much of a martyr as he thinks. A lot of the comments on that video are that, you know, they believe that he has something to what he's saying, and they they like and appreciate what he's saying. And uh, so there are a lot of people. I I know there's a lot of our listeners who appreciated the show when he was on and think that we've gotten a lot of feedback that there is a good, a bigger portion of this uh, community that appreciate what he's saying and have uh, viewpoints more similar to his than, than he believes. I think he gets a bad rap. I really do. I mean, I I certainly enjoy his viewpoint, and I think he's got a good book. So Yeah. It's just if you go speak at a conference where, you know, it's mostly metaphysical and stuff and people are really metaphysical and conspiracy you know, of course, then that's going to be a group of uh, type of people who are not going to be as open to what you're saying. But uh, what's interesting is, especially at our conference, sure, there were some people that were really upset for him saying things like the government doesn't know much about UFOs and stuff. But uh, there were a lot of people who really appreciated and believed what he had to say, too. Yeah, that's true. And you've read his book? No, <laughs> I haven't read the whole thing. I've uh, read pieces and parts Mm. and I I think that uh, when you write a book you need to follow in this suit of UFO book names and call it UFOs colon and then have the name after it yeah UFOs colon sweet exclamation mark I think you have to have three things oh a series of commas really just like Leslie Kane's book really sweet there you go you've got it but in his book, you know, we did print one of the chapters in his book. It was actually the epilogue. And his epilogue, I think, is one of the best things uh, it's written in this field. It was really good because it talked about just how we need to tackle uh, this this subject to be taken serious uh, and to move it on to the next level, which is to get more of uh, the conventional science and stuff like that interested and in participating in the field. And so I, I thought what he wrote in that chapter especially is really, really good. Agreed. And, yeah, let, uh, let up on John Alexander and actually read his book and hear what he has to say. He makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Actually. Well, Alejandro, this is somewhere you and I have to go. Spaceport America, the world's first commercial spaceport, is nearing completion. David Wilson, head of Spaceport America's media relations, recently told Space.com, the spaceport phase one construction work is now 90% done and is on schedule to be done by the end of 2011. The spaceport occupies 1,800 acres of desert land approximately 45 miles north of Las Cruces, New Mexico, and is the world headquarters for the space tourism company Virgin Galactic. Construction has moved quickly since the groundbreaking ceremony on June 19, 2009. According to Wilson, the first phase of construction is made up of the spaceport's large runway, which is completed, the terminal hangar facility that Virgin Galactic will use, the internal roads, fencing, electrical system, water sewer systems, and the dome-looking space observation center. Phase two will include the final build-out of the vertical launch complex facility, the visitor and welcome centers in the neighboring towns of Truth or Consequence, and Hatch, uh, a visitor area on the main spaceport campus. The southern road from Interstate I-25 to the spaceport is also part of phase two construction. According to Space.com, Phase 2 is scheduled to be completed in 2013, making the spaceport fully operational. The completion of Phase 1 construction of the spaceport is good news for Virgin Galactic because they plan to begin launching their commercial space flights in 2013. So it's definitely going to be on time for them, and they are leading the charge, making space flight more attainable for us all. It's so cool looking. It looks The building looks like a manta ray fish. It does. And I love manta ray fish. It looks super cool. I'm really excited about it. And you know what I just thought of since it's in New Mexico and it's near Hatches where it's famous for their chili, green chili and red chili. So being where it's at, 
when you go there to the visitor center, and I'm guessing that visitor center is going to be really busy. They might be making as much money on that visitor center as anything else. I think there's going to be so many people visiting there because it's so cool and, you know, people flying up into space. But when you go out of the visitor center on the road, you'll probably be able to buy people roasting chilies. The road will be lined with pinion chili roasters. nuts. Yes. There'll be uh, beef jerky, people selling that kind of stuff because, you know, people sell stuff on the street like crazy in that part of town. You know that that uh, jer- part of U.S. that jerky company that uh, has their shop in uh, Nevada mm-hmm. on the way to Area 51. They should open up a uh, a second location over by the spaceport. Yeah, that's a good idea. Good. I wonder business. if a little city will build up around the spaceport. It's definitely going to build up. I think it'll take time, but there's definitely going to be a lot of build up around there. Mm-hmm. There's nothing there now, but there will be. Yeah. And it's not far from Las Cruces. Really, it's a great vacation for Space Nuts because you can go there and then you can go to uh, Alamo Gordo and White Sands. And when you drive from Las Cruces to Alamo Gordo, it's a lot of fun because you're driving for Space Geeks, you know, because you're driving through the White Sands uh, missile range. And it's the only road that really goes kind of in the middle of it. So to the right and the left, you have all of these crazy buildings and projects going on. You see signs like high-powered laser testing and small missile testing, large missile testing. Uh, And then there's a museum there with a lot of rockets that's in the White Sands. And when you get to Alamogordo, there's another cool, huge museum with rockets, a V2, uh, stuff like that. So really, for space people, it's a lot of fun. And then it, you're just a few hours away from Roswell if you even wanted to do that. Now you're getting crazy. Yep. Well, we'll have to do it. I'm excited. It's getting close to being done. We need to go check it out. Yep. And last but not least, astronomers announced today the discovery of 50 planets, including one super Earth that may contain water and be in the habitable zone. According to the Washington Post, astronomers have not determined whether the new super Earth is rocky like Earth or grassy like Jupiter, let alone whether it has an atmosphere. I said grassy, but I meant gassy. No. <laughs> gassy is a funny word. Yeah. Yep. But this new super Earth is 3.5 times the mass of Earth, and unlike our wonderful planets we've talked about in the around the star Gliese 581, this one doesn't have nearly uh, as fun of a name. The, 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 the super the, Earth? The star is called HD8. And so the planet's name is 5512B. Not anymore. Now it's Super Earth. Yeah. I think from now on it'll be known as Super Earth. But saying Gliese 581G is a, is still kind of crazy. It doesn't have yeah. a cool name like Jupiter, but yeah. this is even worse. HD8, 5512B. Kind of Anticlimactic more. when you say, goes. we found a Super Earth. It's yeah. called... HD8, 5512B. Yeah. Not anymore. I'm going to call it Super Earth. Please do. So those people, poor people. Then if there's people living there, then they are Super Earthlings. That's kind of cool. you just blew my mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, Alejandro, that is it for the news for today. Remember to check out these stories and more at openminds.tv, your source for UFO-related news. I'm Jason McClellan, your Open Minds news correspondent, and you've been briefed. Back to you, Alejandro. All right. Thank you, Jason. A couple other stories that you will find at openminds.tv, because remember, you can find the UFO news that we just talked about there as well. But Michael Schratt put up a story uh, with some sketches from some strange UFOs over Idaho and Michigan. And one of the cool sketches, these are mostly cases, you know, that are historic, uh, is of this domed disc with a see-through dome, and you can see a couple creatures under it. It's kind of a a neat sketch, very interesting, uh, especially if this is a true account of something someone experienced. So there are some sketches of that. A very controversial post that we put up. Opinion post from Bryce Zabel, who, among other things, wrote uh, with Richard Dolan, AD after disclosure we've had him on the show quite a few times he also was a producer and writer for the dark skies television series which was all about aliens and mj12 and all of that stuff 
So he's really into this issue and working on several projects. He also was in charge of the Academy during the whole 9-11 thing, and I mean the Academy Awards. So he was in charge of making the decision to delay the Academy Awards, not once, but twice when 9-11 happened. Well, he and Nick Pope, who we've talked about, who was the British, uh, he worked for the Mini British Ministry of Defense uh, studying UFOs. They wrote a story together about 9-11, how 9-11 and UFOs don't mix, and essentially talking about how they're two separate issues that we need to keep separate, and they make their arguments to this point. And it's been very controversial. I, unfortunately, have gotten on a couple of email lists where people are emailing back and forth their opinions on all this and blah, 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 which is fine. You know, I don't mean to say that, that they can't have their own opinions, but... Um, that's wonderful that they have their own opinions, but uh, go share them in like a forum that's talking about this. Why do I get on this list? But anyway, a lot of people talking back and forth. You can check that out, and then you can also check it out on our Facebook, and that's where you can put some comments and put in your own opinion uh, there to see what you think. So that was great. Uh, Bryce asked us if we can share that because he's... Uh, a big fan of us as we are a big fan of him and Nick Pope. So there's some great guys. And, you know, his opinion is actually different than Richard Dolan's. And so Richard shared his opinions on their website on this story, which is fine. You know, that's one thing that we have to learn is that uh, it's okay to have varying opinions. We all have different opinions. And I think that's one of the great things about the evolution of this field is that as researchers, we all get to spend a lot more time uh, we've been spending years with each other, and we can like each other as people. We can talk civilly and have differing opinions. That's the way it goes, just like I talked about with Seth Shostak and Paul Davies having differing opinions. They share their different opinions and move on, but they're still good buddies and work together. And so that's what we need to do, too, because uh, although not all of us share the same opinions on Billy Meyer, we could still be buddies and work together. So those are some of the stories you'll see up there. You'll also see a story that got uh, quite a bit of uh, link or play and or people were linking to it. And actually, Coast to Coast put it on their page where Antonio wrote a tribute to some UFO researchers and Fortians who have died recently. And if you're not sure about what a Fortian is, which a lot of people newer to this field aren't, it's essentially someone who studies the paranormal. One of the first paranormal researchers was Charles Fort and he kind of was a, a real pioneer in the field so a lot of people who study different things in the paranormal call themselves Fortean and there's a whole Fortean society Fortean Times magazine which is great online so that's what that is and some of the people who have done this sort of research has passed away and it's sort of alarming how many people have passed away now these are people who have gotten older um, and a lot of the researchers, we've talked about this a lot on this show, a lot of the famous researchers, the people who have done a lot of work in this field, are passing away. They're getting older. They're getting to that age. So you can read about those people on our website as well. So some very great stories. You'll learn a lot. You'll get educated, and you'll keep up to speed on the latest and greatest in ufology so go check out openminds.tv moving on to the most fun part of the show well there's a, the whole show's fun but moving on to our interview for today which is jason mcclellan i've had the pleasure of watching his meteoric rise to the upper echelons of ufology in just a short period of a couple years uh, as being the news correspondent here at Open Minds and also writing for Open Minds magazine. <laughs> he's looking at me funny because he's skeptical, but, you know, people love Jason. They wouldn't like, make him put him in a cartoon if they didn't love Jason. So I am really excited to talk about what I think was some great work uh, on the Billy Meyer case. And uh, thank you for coming all the way from San Diego. He goes to San Diego every other weekend, it seems. Not that often. I don't blame you and when it's burning hot out here. Well, the weather's finally, finally dropped here. It's tolerable here. Finally in the 90s. 
So I guess to start off with, before you started investigating Billy Meyer, how did you feel about the case? Well, the Billy Meyer case is certainly something that it seems everybody who has done any sort of research into UFOs mm-hmm. comes across. I mean, it's it's one of the most well-known, and, and even that, calling it well-known is kind of interesting because a lot of people know of Billy Meyer, yeah. and they know bits and pieces, and that's certainly what I, that's the position I was in as well. You know, I knew that there was this guy, this one-armed guy in Switzerland who had these amazing UFO photographs, and he talked with extraterrestrials. And that's pretty much the extent of what I knew. And I had heard many things from different people. You know, we were fortunate enough to have frequent conversations with Wendell Stevens. And, you know, so talking with people like him who were personally involved in researching the Billy Meyer case, you hear stories from him, you hear stories from absolutely everybody. And it seemed that everybody seemed to have, I won't say a, a, a different piece of the puzzle, but they definitely had different details to to the story and that's what I found fascinating most of all was that everybody seemed to have parts of the same story but parts of a different story as well see I think that's a great way to put it because when I have you know usually most cases I try to really thoroughly investigate but with Billy Meyer I hadn't really thoroughly what I thoroughly read were his uh, communications with extraterrestrials And although I found his pictures very compelling and um, the background around his picture is very compelling, uh, his communications, I actually didn't like very much. I thought they started to get kind of silly where he was just saying, well, this and this is true, right? Yes, Billy Meyer, that's true. And I mean, really, later on in these things, and I read tons of them, that's how a lot of this went. And I gave up on reading those, and I kind of put them in the gray basket and thought, you know, those pictures are really interesting. Uh, They're very great hoaxes, if they were hoaxes at all, and uh, moved on from there. But from reading your story and looking at all the different stuff, I was a little disappointed in what I had investigated because the people I had looked into who investigated the Billy Meyer piece only present little chunks, little pieces here and there as opposed to having an overall view. Um, like your story, I think it's pretty good for as much as you can do in four or five pages. Uh, you know, an uh, overall view of unbiased view on what the deal is. And in that overall view, I mean, it still barely scratches the surface mm-hmm. of the whole Billy Meyer story. There's right. so much there. And most of it, I think, the majority of people who know Billy the Billy Meyer story have no idea that this these other elements to the story exist. Mm-hmm. And what I you know with my initial uh, introduction to Billy Meyer and and before I began my my in depth research, you know one thing I could definitely tell. I mean you, you can't escape it. Billy Meyer case is without a doubt the most polarizing case in ufology. You mentioned that at the beginning of the show. I mean people either believe Billy Meyer or they don't. There's no gray with most people. I mean, mm-hmm. you have these very strong opinions either way. Yeah. And I'm telling you, you know, when I would have Michael Horn on the show, or I think I've only had him once, or when I refer to him, people get really upset. I can't believe you're having him, Billy Meyer, so full of it. I get a lot of that. But, of course, the opposite's true, too, of all these people. Oh, that's the best case ever. And, you know, people who believe, like Michael Horn, that how could you ignore this case? But I guess getting into it, let's go historical in his life and how he started. Because he's got an interesting background, no doubt. So I guess let's start there because, you know, I thought it was a scorpion. You told me it was a phantom. He had this nickname because he was this kind of rogue Ronin type of international soldier or something how would you explain that i forget a description i saw and i I forget whose description this is but they described him during that time is like a mixture between indiana jones and han solo and somebody else (laughs) and this is like the 50s or 60s 
I believe so, yes. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's shortly after his childhood when he went on his widespread journeys traveling through Africa and Asia and Europe. And he, you know, those details are somewhat gray. They're differing stories, but apparently he had a lot of odd jobs during this time, and he worked for the French Foreign Legion, and, and he was also sort of a, a bounty hunter, basically, where he would hunt these fugitives and uh, hold them until they were picked up by whoever was supposed to pick them up. Uh-huh. But, yeah, he, he actually wrote about um, these experiences, too, and I don't read German, and I believe the book is in German, but he actually has a book about that time in his life called The Phantom. What about then um, Saddam Hussein? There's a story where he like met Saddam Hussein, right? There is, and I don't remember the details of that story. I know he met a lot of people, and he's talked about this a lot, and it was it was also during, during this period when he lost his arm in a bus accident, and that happened when a drunk bus driver, not the bus he was in, but a separate bus was coming at them with a drunk bus driver crashed into Billy's bus, and he was thrown from the bus, and his arm was, was hurt so badly it had to be amputated above his left elbow. He's got use but doesn't have the use of an elbow, so he can't have an attachment or anything. Yeah. But that happened during that time, and he also met his wife during that time in Greece. Calliope, I think is how he pronounces it. I would call it Calliope because that's from <laughs> my wife. Is, that's how she would want me to call it from yeah. Greece. But, but yeah, he met his wife then, and then they moved back to uh, Switzerland. Mm-hmm. Now, some of these stories, like the Saddam one, there's not much detail. Correct. But like, what sort of references were there that had some of this old stuff? A lot of this stuff comes from his own writings and you know translations of his writing. So those details, it's difficult to know the accur- accuracy of them because you know they're second and third hand. Mm-hmm. But at least a lot of the research you did do though was his writings or alleged stuff from or his stuff from his website from his own stuff. mouth. Yes, right. Which I think is the most important because I think people kind of cherry pick. Exactly. You know, and uh, but to follow the full story, you need to get to the root. And and again, with the problem with this, with with people having their own versions of the story or having only bits and pieces here and there, focusing on one aspect of Billy Meyer's life, Mm -hmm. it's a big problem. And it's apparent in doing the research. I mean, even some of the, the biggest Billy Meyer researchers, you read their books and they have conflicting information. Hmm. So it makes determining the truth very difficult. Mm hmm. About when was it he started having his, and how did this come about? Or how did this people start knowing about his communications and or pictures? Well, how it started for him was when he was five years old. Hmm. And again, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's translation or, or problems with the, the story staying consistent, but um, a lot of the contacts are like voices in his head. So they're telepathic communication, not actual phys- physical communication. But his, his first, I believe, was, was when he was five years old. Mm-hmm. And uh, an extraterrestrial came in a pear-shaped UFO and invited him aboard, and he went for a ride on a UFO at the age of five. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's when his contacts really started. Um, when he started making it known to people was in the 70s, and that's when he decided to form a group to basically discuss UFOs and other things. And then he started to tell them. Exactly. That's when he first revealed to this group that I've been hanging out with extraterrestrials and I've got proof. Yep. Was it the beginning of when he started the group or not until later on? I don't know how much time passed, Uh but it seemed like that's sort of the purpose that the group was founded for. And another reason behind this group was that when Meyer was doing his worldly travels, he reportedly joined every religion in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, and didn't find any of them to that, that were suitable for him. So he basically started one that had his own ideas. So it was a religion that he started, or was attempting to? That's debatable. Kind of a religious... It's it's debatable, yes. That's another issue that, that causes a lot of problem and a lot of I debate. See. 
but that's basically what it is. It's it's a group with shared ideas and and wisdom passed on to him from extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. So I would call it a religion. Mm -hmm. And he already had photographs at this point, right? Or at least he shared these with people at this point. From what I've been able to determine, it was when this group was founded that he started coming forward with the photos. I see. And so uh, the photos at that time, uh, were they were there other witnesses? Not at that time. Uh huh. Not at that time. It's members of this group um, who later have come forward and said that they were witnesses. His wife is one of those people. But again, later in time, after his wife divorced him, she's been quoted in an interview as saying that he made it all up. So, mm -hmm. What did she say she saw back then? I don't remember. I don't, I don't know her, her actual statements of what okay. she saw. Okay. But uh, later on, she said she made all that up and Billy made all right. that up. And because she said two different things, I mean, it, that is a flag in itself. I mean, you mm -hmm. don't know which of her stories you can trust. So, mm -hmm. so when was it then he also came across uh, like a laser gun or something? Yeah, he was, he was, uh, he claims he was left a laser gun by one of these extraterrestrials. And this is another one of the stories in the Billy Meyer saga that has conflicting details to it. One of the stories says that the extraterrestrial left this laser gun with him and told him not to use it and they would be back for it. And he, Meyer was tempted and he couldn't resist, so he had to try it out. He pulled the trigger and zapped it through this tree. And another version of the story says that he was allowed to shoot the weapon as a demonstration of the weapon. Mm -hmm. so, but we've got pictures of that in the article that's in the magazine. And Wendell Stevens went and looked at this tree. And what he noticed was that there you know, are clearly burn marks on some leaves sort of in the direction going towards this tree and burn marks around the hole, but the inside of that hole had no no indication of being burned at all. Mm -hmm. What were the different versions of this? Or I mean, what were the sources of those different versions? One of the sources is Wendell Stevens' book, uh -huh. um, Contact, what is it? which one is it? It's UFO Contacts, uh, of the Pleiades, uh -huh. and the other, I believe, is um, Guido Moose, Mooseburgers, um, and yet they fly. Okay, and who were the first investigators? European, I guess, or at least American, or I don't know. Well, were there there were there were a few people um, who'd been looking into it, you know, since since Meyer announced it. Mm. Um, uh, Switzerland researcher Lou Zintag. I don't know how to say her name, but uh, she's the one who came to the U.S. to uh, present the story to Wendell Stevens. And when Wendell saw the, saw the photographs she presented to him, he was blown away and thought they were the most incredible UFO photos he'd ever seen. And remember, this is Wendell Stevens, who had pretty much the largest private UFO photo collection. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he'd seen decades worth of photos already by the time the Meyer photos were presented to him. Mm -hmm. So he was so blown away that he decided to go over to Switzerland and investigate himself. So he and uh, Lee and Britt Elders uh, were probably the, the biggest investigators, initial investigators of the Meyer story. Do you know when Wendell started his investigation? I don't know the date, no. Do you know about when or... It was in the 70s. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I asked, just because 70s had so many UFO sightings that had started that, uh, or that were going on, because that was a big wave in the 70s. So he had seen a lot of UFO photos yeah. at that time. So that would be interesting. Now, one of the things that you watch were all of the investigations, like some of the videos and stuff that uh, the elders and Wendell had put together. Those are kind of fun videos. Uh -huh. I like them. Uh, they're very, I don't know. It's like you're watching an old PBS special. It's kind of fun. But this was a, a very well done documentary uh -huh. documenting that that very trip. They're, you know, one of their investigations over there where they actually go 
to see Billy Meyer and talk to him and walk through the various locations of where Meyer took the photos. And what year was, do you remember about what year that documentary was? I don't remember the date on that. And that was, it's an amazing production. I mean, they, they actually have aerial shots showing the cars drive by. But that, now that you mention it, that trip was actually documented um, very well in a book by Gary Kinder called Light Years. And this, this book talks about um, the investigation that was shown in the documentary. And I, I believe the documentary is just called Contact, the Billy Meyer story. Um, but uh, this is the book that the elders actually recommended that I read because it does document their investigation. And I found that book kind of interesting in itself because it, it seems to kind of glamorize Billy Meyer, not, not really glamorize, but hype him up a lot as this larger than life character to where he sort of appears out of nowhere and can see through fog and automatically know where he's going and just kind of presents them as being in awe of this strange person who silently crept up beside them and they had no idea he was there and stuff like this. Yeah. So that Kinder book, um, you also said Wendell was of course a big source for you. Absolutely. So were the elders. Uh, this Moose Burger, you said he was a big source also. Yes. Uh, tell me about him. I don't know much about him as an individual. Um, he spent a lot of time uh, with Billy. Um, he was even a part of the um, Figu Society, Billy's um, group there that he created, and I believe he still is. Um, so he had a lot of firsthand experience there, and he actually uh, witnessed things while he was there. Mm -hmm. So, and then who else was uh, some of the other big sources for you? Well, there's uh, Jim Dilatoso, mm -hmm. who uh, was responsible for, for helping to uh, get some of the, the metal testing. Billy Meyer had given Wendell some, some metal samples that he claimed were given to him by the extraterrestrials. So uh, Wendell and uh, Jim Dilatoso together uh, facilitated getting this metal tested. Mm -hmm. So there were some of, some of uh, Jim's findings there that were a good source. Uh, but, you know, I, I've got to say that uh, even though I don't, don't like looking a lot uh, at what harsh skeptics have to say, um, Cal K. Corp has a lot of information about the Meyer case. And I know Michael Horn and other Meyer su supporters um, dismiss absolutely everything that Cal Corp says. Um, Cal Corp has actually done one of the best in-depth research r studies into the whole Meyer case. Um, and I can't confirm this 100%, but according to Corp, he actually went undercover and became a member of the Figu Society mm -hmm. and went over there solely for the purpose of finding out if this guy was a real deal or not. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about him some more too, but those medals, just getting back to that, just since you brought those up, um, you know, what were the findings with those medals then? Again, mixed. Uh huh. And uh, so, according to uh, Guido Mooseberger's book, and yet they fly, um, the testing that was done by a metallurgist found the metals to be simple uh, cooking pot metal, mm -hmm. uh, metal that would be used to make uh, toy soldiers or something like that. Um, and then a second person tested the metals, and that was a chemist. And the chemist found them to be very interesting and possibly not from this world. Um, and the interesting thing about this is uh, Cal Corp, who we just mentioned, um, contacted these people. And the chemist uh, told him that his findings were completely misrepresented in Wendell Stevens' book. And those mm. aren't the findings that he found at all. Um, and... Jim Dilatoso has an explanation for that, uh, saying that the places that they got um, the metals tested and the photos tested, um, they did so under strict confidentiality agreements and understandings that if anybody contacted them about doing these tests, they were supposed to say that they had no knowledge of 
Billy Meyer. They had no idea what you're talking about. So, you know, again, that you can take that for what it is. You know, yeah, it, but it, it seems just a bit inconclusive. It's inconclusive, and uh-huh. it you know it gives a perfect out. You know, obviously, because you know it's up to what what you believe. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you go to somebody who didn't do a test; they're going to say, "I didn't do a test." Right. So if you say, "Oh, that's because we told them to say that," you know, you have no idea. Yeah. Well, and you would think you would need to produce some paperwork to prove that. Right. That you had this agreement, because otherwise. Um, there's no proof, and especially when people are communicating, they forget. I, you know, definitely talked with people where they tell me a bit of information, and then I check with the source, and the source is like, uh, well, they weren't supposed to tell you that. And then you get back with the other person, and they're like, well, I don't remember them ever telling me I didn't have to, I wasn't supposed to. It doesn't say that in any emails, where people just have a misunderstanding, and unless it's written, you know, and very clear, you can't really expect people to be held to to that sort of thing. And I'm certainly not saying that that evidence, that documentation doesn't exist. Right. I'm just saying I haven't seen it. Yeah. So. Well, I'm not, yeah. It, just to say that the, it's hard to say just that part's inconclusive as well is what I'm saying. Right. And it would be nice to see that documentation. Did Is there any such? I mean, did they That's talk what I, said. About I just that? said. I have no idea. Yeah. It could exist, but not not to my knowledge. Yeah. So what are some of the other than uh, like criticisms of Corp's work that didn't maybe hold for you? I mean, well, uh, you know, there. Why would you say that he was in depth and and he was uh, more accurate than maybe they accuse him of being? Well, one of the the initial um, criticisms that uh, get thrown at people who speak against Billy Meyer um, is that, well, you you didn't actually go there. You didn't meet him. So how can you tell what kind of research is sitting and looking on a computer? You have to actually go there and meet Billy. And that's something that Corp did on more than Mm -hmm. one occasion. Which is a silly argument anyway. I mean, you don't need to meet someone in order to figure out whether there's a truth or not to something. In fact, I would argue that in some investigations, it's better not to, because then you're not tainted, especially someone like me, because I like people. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll, I, that makes me biased when I met someone, because I'm like, you know, I really like that guy. But uh, you still have to look at the evidence, and right. the evidence speaks for itself. And speaking of, of Michael Horn, I want to talk about Michael Horn for a minute. Um, you know, I will say that if you want to know anything, any any strong details about a particular area of the Billy Meyer case, he's the guy to ask, man. I mean, he he can recite to you to the to the word stuff that Meyer has said, things that have been told to him. You know, he, he knows every single detail. So he's a good person to come back to any question or any attack or anything. He's got an answer for everything. And I've only, I don't know him that well, but I know that he isn't just a blind believer. You know, he started out pretty skeptical himself, but he's been satisfied. And he knows that not every answer is a perfect answer and that, you know, things could be more clear and he would like them to be, but he just presents the information he has and he does a very good job at doing that. Mm -hmm. And... For some reason, he, well, I, I know the reason, but he and uh, Cal Korf are always butting heads. And it's because Korf is a thorn in his side, obviously. But um, one thing they haven't agreed on is the fact that someone has been able to reproduce the Meyer photos. Mm-hmm. And that's something that, that Horn has stated for a long time, that till this day, nobody's been able to reproduce the Meyer photos. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Phil Langdon has done what I think is a remarkable job at recreating the photos. And again, I mean, it's the same premise as as the factor faked television show on sci-fi. Just because you can recreate it doesn't mean that it's not true. But at the same time, you don't need to say that they haven't been reproduced when they have been reproduced. Some of these are fantastic. I mean, the, the, the wedding cake UFO 
If you have seen Meyer photos, you've most likely seen the wedding cake UFO. It's got these balls all around it and looks very gaudy. Um, that's one, and, and Phil Langdon has been able to reproduce pretty much every single photo. And the wedding cake photo is one that he's done a really good job on and, and something that people thought nobody would be able to do because it's so bizarre and different looking. But, you know, he's done a great job recreating these photos. And he's also been able to reproduce um, sounds that Meyer recorded, claiming that they're from a, a spaceship, a beam ship. And uh, he determined that it was fishing line strung a very long distance. The wind going against that fishing line created this bizarre resonance, and it was identical to the sound. Mm -hmm. But he's done a fantastic job at, at recreating some of this thing, these things. And just because he recreates them doesn't mean that what's in the photos is not authentic or what's on the tape is not authentic. But he's been able to reproduce something that is just like it. See, and that was a big sticking point for me is that uh, I agreed with Horn and, and, you know, by listening to him a lot too, but uh, that no one had recreated the photos and I hadn't seen any good recreations. But when I was pointed to these recreations, they are very good. I mean, they really do recreate, which I have not seen before. Yeah. They totally recreate those pictures. And that was a big deal. But uh, getting to the pictures again, though, uh, like you said, just because a picture is recreated doesn't mean that it's not real. Right. I mean, and that happens a lot because especially these days, you can recreate practically anything with special effects and stuff like that. However, what really throws uh, a, a, a whole wrench in the whole system with the pictures is this idea that uh, you have in the story about Billy Meyer saying his pictures were replaced. Yes. And so what is that story? Well, I think it mostly originated, um, most people, well, many people may know the, the, the controversy behind the photos um, that uh, Meyer alleged were of two extraterrestrials, um, Asket and Nira, aboard um, one of their beam, beam ships. And um, skeptics later were able to, well, they pointed out that uh, this was a still photo uh, of a television screen um, of a, a, a group from the Dean Martin Variety Show. And when you see the pictures, you can tell that that's pretty much the case. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, those two women have been made aware of this and they later said, yeah, that's, uh, that's us. <laughs> right. And it's funny because in one of these, in the picture, the woman has her hair kind of curled, um, I guess by like, sideburns a little curled up. And that's a funny point that um, some people had latched onto and used as a description of these extraterrestrials, saying that they looked, looked identical to Earthlings, but had elongated earlobes. And this woman, who is in the photo and was identified later, said, yeah, I used to curl my hair like that. It's just her hair that's curled. Uh -huh. But anyway, um, so what came from this was um, Meyer said that uh, one of the extraterrestrials um, informed him in 1998 that, or it might have been sooner than that, but he was informed by the extraterrestrial that um, there were American doubles for Asket and Nira living in the United States and that his photos had been replaced by the men in black. The men in black had located these American doubles and they took a picture and they took Meyer's film and swapped it out. Mm -hmm. So when Meyer got the film, he didn't know it had been swapped out, but in fact what the pictures we see now are of those American doubles. Mm -hmm. But was this also true for some of the UFO pictures? Exactly. That's what, what he later claimed as well in a letter that was on the FIGU website um, saying that, that he was informed that the men in black had done this with a lot of his photos. A lot of his earlier photos, I, I believe, is how he, he stated it, and I don't know what time period that quantifies. But he said that, um, again, the men in black um, had been taking his film and then recreating his photographs and slipping them back in. So Meyer had no knowledge of it, but 
the photos that he had and was showing to everybody were actual recreations by the men in black. Mm -hmm. And this is a tough one, too, because this, like you said, is on the Figu website. This comes from his mouth. Right. And now this is a fact that's left out by a lot of people. Yeah. I've never heard Michael Horn talk about this. I think I've seen him him mention it, but I don't remember how he responds to it. And that's certainly a uh -huh. good question for him. Um, and some of these other people, Wendell never talked about that. Right. In fact, Wendell uh, talks about the pictures uh, being, he doesn't mention that when he talks about the pictures, when we, we've talked to him. And in fact, he did talk about uh, the pictures, him not being able to get originals. Right. Nobody has originals, not even Meyer. And that's another thing that, you know, Meyer says that the originals were taken back by the extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have originals. When Wendell was there, the best he could get was, he got some second generation, but m most were up through sixth generation negatives. And those are, the, those are the prints that were, all this testing was done on. Yeah. It's like sixth generation images. See, and that's really important to me because if the extraterrestrials took the originals, then I'm sorry, Michael Horn, and I'm sorry, Billy Meyer, but that would indicate that either that if this story is true, that the extraterrestrials didn't want him to have evidence to prove that his stuff was real. Right. So really, they can't blame anybody for doubting the story, but the extraterrestrials should that be true but of course it always throw, it also throws a wrench because it's de it makes it harder for us earthlings to buy that uh he doesn't have the originals because the aliens took him away um that's really difficult for me and especially because you know i remember the first time uh, you told me about that i'm like what where did this come from and it well it comes from billy meyer's mouth you know that's that's a stretch to believe and it's something that shouldn't be left out it's, you know? an, it's an important detail and it's uh -huh. something that, that should be addressed you know it, it needs to be answered and and I don't know I'm, I'm sure I'm sure Billy Meyer has has responded to it but you know I, his responses are this is what they told me yeah that the aliens took it where did you run across that at first across the letter or that that letter existed Oh, that was the, the figure. So you found that. Mm -hmm. So what was it like when you discovered that? It was, you know, it, it's amazing that you don't hear more people talking about it. It, yeah. it kind of gets blown off, but that's yeah. that's a real major, major piece of the puzzle there to, mm -hmm. that raises serious questions about everything. Yep. Did I mean, did Carl Korff talk about that? Yes. What about some of these others? But keep in mind that most yeah, the strong majority of the research that's been done on the Billy Meyer case is pre-1998. Yeah. And that's when most of this stuff has come out. Oh, gotcha. Even Leah, the, the elders, um, you know, haven't haven't kept up to date on the recent happenings with Billy Meyer. They, they had said that, that, you know, for years they haven't looked into it. Okay. So there aren't any books with this information because people haven't put out recent books about Billy Meyer. What about De La Tosa? Like you talked to him. Did he mention that or no. did you mention that to him at all? No, I haven't asked him about that at all. Yeah, Just curious. Cause you know, I mean, this is a big thing that people have to answer. Yeah. And it'd be great to hear from Jim because you know, like I said, he was, he was, uh, primarily responsible for organizing all of this testing of the photos and of the metal. And you know, he was able to get into some pretty big laboratories, um, according to him, uh, to do this testing, you know, JPL and, and different big labs. Um, so, you know, they claim that they found these photos to be authentic, but, you know, according to Meyer, they're not. So who knows? Yeah. So, and that's the thing. And I know Jim and, you know, Jim's a great guy. Yeah. He's a nice guy and he doesn't like really putting down a solid opinion. He's never got a solid, solid opinion. Which I, I don't blame him because there's a lot of things I don't have a solid opinion on either. But there's lots of times where I ask him, well, what about this evidence? That kind of sheds some doubt on that. Yeah, you're right. It does shed doubt. What about this evidence? That seems to mean that that's real. 
Yeah, that does seem like maybe it's real. So I know how he is. He's like the rest of us, just trying our best to look for answers and stuff. So I can see that. But this is definitely one I think will be interesting for uh, Michael Horn, because, I mean, that's that's a, a big issue right there. Otherwise, I don't know. Uh, that, for me, that, for me, really kind of throws this whole thing out of the gray basket um, to the highly skeptical, probably... I'm not a that coupled with that the pictures can be faked is to me kind of uh very bad <laughs> for the Billy Meyer case. Right. And it makes me feel very skeptical about well, the whole and, thing. You know, the, it, it's funny the the excuses that that people throw out, uh you know, the reasons why these photos couldn't be hoaxed, you know, a one-armed man couldn't do that, but he did a lot of things and does a lot of things with his one arm. It's yeah. not really a limitation for him. Um, he had this figure group going. There were plenty of people all the time around him. Um, he had children. He had a wife. You know, he wasn't alone, so there were people who could help him. Um, and he did, in fact, create models of these ships. He admitted to attempting to create models of these beam ships and photograph them. You know, there's a story of the the photos being found burned in a trash can, and there are conflicting stories about that too. But he right. actually did create models uh -huh. so. of the ships, and that's yes. from his mouth. Yes, and there are th the differing stories are that um, one says that um, the model or a model was actually left with him by one of the extraterrestrials, a model of her beam ship, uh -huh. so he could try to re photograph it. Yeah. And, and Meyer didn't like the outcome of the photo, so he threw him away. And yeah, which is all pretty damning stuff. Right. I mean, and here again, it's it's stuff you don't hear about. Models being made. I'm making this list for Michael Horn if, you know, he's got to answer these questions if he... Because these are tough questions to answer. I'm sorry. You know, they're, uh, they're for me, uh, too difficult. Um, so were there other, you know, big red flags where stuff like the models is definitely one of them, the one you brought up, that you ran across that were like, hey, I never, you know, you don't hear about this much. Why don't we hear about this? It's just a lot of the little details that are left out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, Meyer uh, is painted as this poor old farmer. Um, but, you know, this, this figure group is very active. They've got this big semi center there it's it's very big and uh these are basically dues paying members it's like a, a, a tithe or something they're required to pay yeah and uh it's big money uh but he's also a prolific writer mm -hmm. i mean this guy writes and and he supposedly types 80 words a minute but uh with his one hand but he he's written tons of books and these books are out like i said he's got a book about uh his, his life is the phantom, and he's got these uh, books with word-for-word uh, -word interactions with the extraterrestrials. I mean, he's got lots of books and uh, keeps very, very active. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot more to Billy Meyer than a lot of people understand. Yeah, and I think that's the problem, is that we hear a lot of the parts that I wasn't aware of, and I can see why now, is what he said himself, what comes out of his mouth. Because I think we have a lot of people, you know, I, I read this book recently and I did a review on the magazine, kind of a lukewarm uh, review, honestly, of this book Mirage Men by uh, Pilkington. And um, I was a little, he, I, uh, uh, taken aback by, you know, there he seemed to have his opinion set. But he has some really good points on some things in this field that we can't forget. And one of those is cognitive dissonance, which was a term that was created when these like doomsday groups would say, oh, the world's going to end in 1942. And then the world wouldn't end. And they're like, oh, the world, you know, we've seen this before. The world didn't end because of this and that, and it's probably going to end later. So in other words, they were willing when they were faced with an, them being wrong or the truth not being what they were told it was, they would, in their mind, justify that and change the story so they can keep believing their belief system. And, you know, it seems in this there's a case of people saying, well, what Billy Meyer said was this, and this is what he meant, and here's his story. Let me tell you Billy Meyer's story because, 
you know, he and not letting us know that he's already told his story. It's just that his story, I'm sorry, with uh, the pictures supposedly being replaced by aliens, the models, supposedly one of them given to him by an alien, and then him not liking the pictures he took of it, so burning them. And then third, I already had a problem with this laser gun because you guys will be able to see the picture in the magazine. The laser gun looks absolutely ridiculous. And that these guys gave him a laser gun and then later took it away because, you know, they didn't want him to play with it. Um, you know, that was already an issue. But now this is a, that's, those are my three strikes you're out right there. So I really, you know, and, and I'm definitely willing to go on the record and say, I don't, you know, I, I love the pictures and I always will. I'm going to hang one up on my wall because I love his pictures. He definitely created some very pretty pictures. But yeah, unfortunately, I don't think I believe in the Billy Meyer case anymore. I have so many problems with it. And, you know, I am, I certainly believe that he may have had contact. He may have seen something. He may Mm -hmm. have, you know, who knows? But, you know, this whole story just sort of falls apart the deeper you go. Yeah. But I will say Michael Horn is actually visiting Billy Meyer uh, again very soon. So it'll be interesting to hear what new revelations he has from Billy now. I know a lot of a lot yeah. of stuff that's being pushed from Billy now are his, his predictions. Yeah, and that's really what Ma- Michael Horn's big right. he hangs his hat on is these predictions that he says uh, come true. Uh, but those are always really difficult because when you're, t- t- you know, predicting a gajillion things, you know, sure you're going to be right here and there. Um, you know, if I said there's going to be an earthquake. Uh, this month and it's going to be bad you know any w- earthquake can be determined as bad and then of course the worse it is the more i seem like a incredible prophet right but uh i guess to end on a sort of a positive note and we'll see what you think about one thing that i i am impressed by and i think is interesting and lent that maybe he has seen ufos before in his life is the ufo that he witnessed with uh this lady in india who's now a diplomat. I mean, um, and I, and there's a photograph of that. And uh, that seems different than his other photos. Right. And she's such a credible witness that I do find that, you know, interesting. And maybe that is a legitimate picture. Right. Yeah, it could be. And it definitely does look a lot different from his other photos. Yeah. But, but again, he's got, he's got film, he's got audio, he's got so much stuff, but... You know, with all the details together, it's really hard to believe that it's all true. Yeah, too hard for me to believe. And with people who have been very active in the investigations and written books and you yeah. know, people that are cited as these main reference points, their information is, is all conflicting. Yeah, I mean, like conflicting information, stuff left out that shouldn't have been. And we're, we're pretty much out of time already. I mean, that went really quick, but, uh, you know, for me, I think the story that you did is great, uh, and I think it was important enough that you had discovered some things that are forgotten, maybe conveniently forgotten, or maybe just people didn't know about that did research early on that it was important enough that we should talk about it on the show. Well, and again, I I don't pretend to be an expert. This is just information that I was able to pull out just by looking through the sources that are available. An unbiased look. And, you know, all you have to do is look at more than one source, and you'll start to see all this stuff. Which is important. That's what you got to do, people. Yep. That's how you research. You look at multiple, multiple sources and find the sources of your sources because I've found lately, especially some researcher says, some scientists say it's this, and you go look it up, and they've totally misinterpreted the scientists or kind of twisted their words. Oh, yes. But we are out of time. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you found this interesting. I find this information very interesting, and I'm going on the record that Billy's no longer in my gray basket. Doesn't mean I don't like him or his pictures. It just means that, unfortunately, I'm skeptical of his story. Next week, we're going to have Leslie Kane on, which is going to be fun because she had this documentary that went out uh, recently. And, of course, we'll talk about some of the important things. A lot of people have been asking her about the Belgium picture of the Triangle UFO because they had that in the documentary, although recently we heard that it was faked. Was it really faked? 
is this the right guy? Sometimes people say, oh, I took that picture and I faked it. And they're not even the pe person who took the picture. So we'll find out more about that from Leslie herself and what it was like to make this History Channel documentary that she's been working on ever since the Congress. She was at the UFO Congress in February. So thank you all for joining Open Minds. Radio, don't forget to visit openminds.tv for more UFO news. We'll talk to you next week, people.